Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Maggie and I organise Melbourne's Libby on the Rocks. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you one of our Libby on the Rocks regulars, who is Topher. Topher is a writer, director, author, and activist. He's also a salsa dance teacher. Um, he's made a whole bunch of short films. Um, they've been featured on Henry Box Talk. Um, a couple of them are The Forbidden History of Unpopular People, which was about free speech. And another one was The Forbidden History of Terrible Taxes. And they're short and punchy and really, really good and good for converting your Libby curious friends. So I think you should all come have a look at them at tovar.com.au. And he is going to talk to us about communicating Libby. Yay! Thank you. Just so that you guys know, Maggie was thrown into the deep end at the last minute to do that introduction. So, well done, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to bring up my notes here so that I've actually got something to talk to you based upon. I would regard communication as probably the greatest challenge that we face as libertarians and as a movement, uh, out of all of the many challenges that we face. We have some incredible minds, and I think John is a great example of that, doing some incredible work in all kinds of technical areas, able to engage in a debate at the level that I can't, at a level that you know many people in this room wouldn't be able to do. There are a lot of great organisations doing some really fantastic work, the IPA being one of them, the CIS, Cato Institute. There are, there are organisations all over the world turning out high quality uh, material that the vast majority of the world completely ignores. And this, I think, is the greatest problem that we face. How do we get to people and how do we communicate with people in ways that they will actually pay attention? Where we're actually going to have the chance to influence them with some of this fantastic material that we have. And that's what I'd like to, uh, to talk to you about. The last 50 to 60 years, I would, I would put to you, have not been good for liberty in the Western world. Uh, you're free to, feel free to disagree with me on that if you wish, but in my view, the last 50 to 60 years have seen a massive increase in the degree to which government intrudes in our lives and a massive reduction in the freedom of choice that we have to make for ourselves. That's partly been because we've lost the, the communication war. Now I'm going to show you a video in just a minute that illustrates what I think is wrong with the way that we're communicating and what is right with the way that those who would like to reduce the freedom are communicating and the lessons that we can learn from how they are playing the game. The problem here is that people don't think with their head. And so often, and I, I see this all the time on online debates, I'm sure you guys have all engaged in online debates, you've all, you've all had arguments of one kind or another, it kind of comes with that territory. And I see this time and time again, where people have fantastic arguments, where they're really getting stuck in, and I'm reading what they're saying, saying, yeah, absolutely. But what that person is failing to realise is that people they are trying to convince aren't thinking with their heads. They're arguing with intellectual stuff, and it's good stuff, but they're not hitting this person where they're actually thinking. They're thinking with their hearts, and the vast majority of people already have an opinion on almost everything. But they use their head to justify what their heart already wants to believe. And arguing against their head often isn't actually going to get very far. What we need to do is deal with them at the heart level. Now, I'm not saying this to say that all the academic work is useless, far from it. What I'm saying is we need to add to that. We need to add to what we're already doing and what some people are already very good at, another layer of communication. There's an old quote, let me write the songs of a nation, and I care not who writes its laws. Now that's a tribute to a bunch of different people. I don't know what the history of the quote, it's very, very dubious as to where it actually comes from. But I consider it to be true. Let me write the songs of a nation, and I care not who writes its laws. And what whoever the first person who said that was saying was culture in the form of music, in the form of song, is actually more powerful than politics. See, politics will have a tremendous influence over the next five to ten years in this country. Political debates, who we vote for, those sorts of things, will be tremendously influential over the next five to ten years. But you know what will dictate the future of this country in the next ten to fifty years? Culture. Politicians can only make choices based on what's currently politically possible. If a politician steps too far outside of what the public wants and what's currently politically possible, they are very quickly marginalised and they are very quickly disappeared. So politicians can, can get the best out of what's currently available, but it's culture that actually dictates what's available. 
and what these politicians have to choose from. The real war, in the long term, is being fought in culture, not in politics. David Leonholm is in a, a very, very tough position. I'm sure he needs no introduction in this room. He finds himself in a really tough position because he has taken public stands on a number of issues that are viewed by the public as not available at the moment. And the challenge that is before him is to figure out how to navigate the very dangerous political waters that he now finds himself in. I agree with the vast majority of his positions. The trouble is, the vast majority of the Australian public doesn't agree with me or him. And because he's taken a public stand on those issues, he finds himself potentially going to be marginalised. We already see other political organisations trying to do that to him, trying to portray him as the gun senator, as the euthanasia senator, trying to push him off on some issue that doesn't yet have enough public support. This is the risk that all libertarians run. If we allow other people to control the future of culture, we will simply become culturally unacceptable. The politics will become irrelevant after another 10 years or so. So how do we fight the cultural war? How do we do it? Well, I want to tell you about some people who are fighting it very well. Because I think if we just learn their lessons and start using their methods, we can turn things around very, very quickly. I'd like to play a video. Now, this video was the first time that I ever really got slapped in the face with the cultural war that is going on right now in popular culture. Now, I said before, I, let me write the songs of a nation and I care not who writes its laws. By songs in today's context, I mean television, I mean films, I mean radio, I mean comedians, and yes, songs. The entirety of popular culture is what I'm talking about here. Popular culture is having a bigger influence on our future than pretty much anything else. Let's play the United States of Tara. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, sorry, I didn't realise that was in my control. <laughs> We're a well-oiled machine. <laughs> studying acting, and part of the course was that we were required to watch an episode of television every single week, which was quite difficult for me because long ago I gave up on popular culture and television and films and stopped watching them. Uh, and so one week the assigned episode that we had to watch was the United States of Tara, and it so happened that it was that episode that had that little exchange. Now what was interesting was that that character, the Ron Paul supporter, he was new in that episode. We hadn't met him before. We just meet him in this episode and we discover very quickly he's very intelligent. He's quite well dressed, he's witty, he's funny, and he's the boyfriend of one of the characters, which was obviously a persistent character that we were supposed to very much like. Everything was working in this guy's favour until that scene. We were set up. Because then all of a sudden, he turns into a homophobe. Then all of a sudden, he turns into someone who's intolerant, not particularly tactful, etc., etc., etc. The hit came in that scene right there. And they were not very subtle, were they? Ron Paul supporter? Really? <laughs> I mean, come on, you could not have written it any more clearly what their agenda was. Now, that episode first aired in the US in the lead up to the 2008 presidential elections. Uh, sorry, in the, excuse me, in the lead up to the 2012 presidential elections. So when Obama was trying to get re elected. Okay? 
Some people are playing this game of culture, and they're playing it hardball, and they are completely shameless about their agenda, about what they want, and about what they want you to think. Now, that is a particularly clever example, because a whole lot of people watch that, and now one day when they meet their very first real-life Lumpur supporter, they're not meeting them with an open book. They're not meeting them with a blank page. They have an opinion on wrong principles based on nothing more than what they watched sitting comfortably in their laundry one night over dinner. And it's not a good opinion, is it? Very, very clever. And I want you to pay particular attention to the way that they've been inoculated. They saw the wrong Paul supporter not as someone who came across straight away as intolerant and homophobic and all the rest of it. No, no, no. When we first met him in that episode, he was sharp, he was smart, he was clever, he was funny. We liked him. But then we discovered the truth. Subtle, powerful, cynical, really cynical. I mean, these people think their audiences are idiots. You know what the problem is? <laughs> They're right. Their audiences are idiots. That's the problem that we face. So, that is probably the best example that I can give you of the way the communication war is being played. And it's being played dirty. The left woke up a long time ago to the power of popular culture, and it's time for us to catch up. It's time for us to get in this game. So, sometimes it's, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes it's not so obvious. I want to talk about the movie Avatar. Yeah, James Cameron's big animated thing, right? James Cameron is a man with a very strong agenda. He's also a man who's a little bit limited in creativity, if I'm honest. Um, how do I get back to... Computers aren't my thing. Give me a camera, I'm right. Computers, no. Uh, so, Walt Disney's Avatar, um, or should I say Pocahontas Remade, um, was extremely popular and remains to this day the most profitable film ever made. This, if you search for, if you search for Pocahontas, or Avatar is Pocahontas, you'll find this. This is a complete rundown of the entire story of uh, Pocahontas, with the names and places changed, uh, and it matches Avatar perfectly. So for those of you who think that you have to come up with something original to make money in today's media landscape, think again. Uh, in fact, the only real meaningful difference between uh, Avatar and Pocahontas, uh, just as soon as the computer stops hating me. Whose computer is this? That's mine. Your computer hates freedom. <laughs> <laughs> So that's little one. Yes. Yes, yes, that's what it is. Yes, there we go. That's the only bit of difference. <laughs> James Cameron remade an old movie with some fancy special effects and made more money than anyone else has ever made out of the movie. He also was paid money by everyone who showed up to that theatre to preach to them. Preach to them on issues of war. Preach to them on issues of environment. And I use the word preach deliberately. You see, very few people in the world will come up with what they believe on any subject completely out of the blue. Very few people are genuinely original thinkers who go, you know what I believe on this, it's this thing, and it's something no one else has ever thought of before. For the vast majority of people, we will pick what we believe on any given subject from within the range of beliefs that we've come across that have been presented to us by someone else. We might mix and match a little bit, we might pick bits from here and there, but ultimately, in most all cases, it comes from within the realm of what we've come across. Rewind 150 years, and the people telling people how to live and what to believe, giving them their range of options from which to believe, were family members, preachers, maybe a few educators, a couple of other townsfolk. Today, by far, the majority of the time, we are allowing ourselves to be influenced by the media. The media is giving us our range of options, our range of beliefs from which most people will choose what they believe. They are quite literally preaching to us. And young people today who never show up in church will spend hours every day watching television, listening to the radio in their car, looking up their favourite comedians on YouTube. They are constantly being preached to by popular culture. A couple of other examples of a clear agenda inside a movie, and in my opinion, very good movies. District 9. Love that movie. Clear agenda. All the Lethal Weapon movies. I enjoyed them. These days they're a bit old and a bit kitsch, I know that, but I enjoyed them. But they all had clear agendas. They were all trying to deal with some sort of perceived social issue at the time. The bad guys that they chose were not randomly chosen. They were chosen because they wanted to make a statement. <coughs> they were chosen deliberately. 
Now, I don't know what cartoons you guys watched when you were young, but when I was growing up, it was things like Power Rangers, Ninja Turtles, and Captain Planet. Yeah? yeah? Now go through those in your head and ask yourself, who are the bad guys? Capitalists, businessmen, industrialists, people actually get you. <laughs> right? These are the bad guys in the cartoons that we grew up watching, and it's only gotten worse. The cartoons kids that are watching today are even worse. They are far more blatant. Is it any surprise that our generation and younger generations are absolute cannon fodder for the environmental movement? because they have been brought up and taught in their heart of hearts since they were young that capitalists are the bad guys, that industrialists are the bad guys. And when you come in with your logical arguments, your charts and your stats, you do not have a chance of changing their heart because you're arguing against their head. You see the problem? This is why we need to get into the popular culture space. We've got to get in and play this game at this level. Get people here. Tell them stories. Make them fall in love with characters. Let them meet industrialists who are actually good people. Let them meet environmental activists who turn out to be the assholes. Let them meet big government UN people who turn out to be the corrupt ones. We've got to tell these stories and give people a wider range of beliefs from which to choose how they are going to see the world, how they are going to see what Paul supporters, how they are going to see business owners. This is where the game is at. And long term, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, the outcome of this is what will set the direction for our culture. All right. Now, that's a little bit heavy, so something slightly happier. Ron Swanson. Yeah. Great example of the right way to play this game. One character in one TV show has done more to legitimise and normalise libertarian thought <coughs> in, in popular culture than all the studies in the world combined. Yeah, now, I'm not for a moment saying the studies aren't important. We need them. We need the battle being fought at that level as well. But within popular culture, Ron Swanson has done more for libertarianism than just about anything else in mind. And I, I loved whoever it was that put those little cards, I think it was, yeah, in the, in the packs. Uh, I can do what I want, Ron Swanson. <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and there is a classic example of the right way to, to engage in the culture. Now, I've talked about here, films and so forth where it's quite obvious, where the agenda is very obvious. I want to move on to where it's sometimes not quite so obvious. And I want to talk about James Bond versus Liam Neeson's character in Taken. Now these are two films that, that would sit side by side on the video store shelf for these days, what is it, Netflix or Hulu or whatever, you know. You search for your action movie category and they're both going to kind of come up under the same category. James Bond, Taken, kind of the same thing. Here you've got this guy travelling around the world using all these special skills that he's acquired over a long period of time to take down the bad guys, right? Superficially, very similar films. Underneath, these are radically different films. Now, I'm not talking about their attitude towards libertarianism, I'm talking about their attitude to family. I'm not here to tell you what you, sh what you should or shouldn't think of family, sorry. Too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> This is James Bond's attitude towards women. Yeah? Now, it's not a major thing, it's not the plot of the Bond films, but in every single Bond film, you will find that James Bond regards women as an object of personal pleasure to be used, abused, and disposed of. Every single film has got a different one in one, two, or three over the course of the film. Now, I'm not here to say that that's bad or good, that's up to you to decide, but I want you to notice it. Now, where's this magic button? Haha! <laughs> I can do technology. <laughs> Liam Neeson, now, okay, this isn't actually the problem. <laughs> I couldn't say no. Um, just be glad it's not a rip roll. Yeah. Um, Liam Neeson's attitude was that he would go to the ends of the earth to protect his family, even though the family had broken down. This isn't some idealised, perfect 1950s family. This is a broken family, but his attitude towards his daughter and towards women was that he would do anything and risk anything to protect them. Superficially, now again, I'm not here to tell you that one's right and one's wrong. I want you to see the difference between two packages, two sermons that were very similar. Yeah, a Bond film taken, same shelf on the video store. Two very different messages for people to absorb about women and the status of women and the value of women. I don't think that was deliberate. I don't think someone sat down when the you other, know, what's his name, Fleming, who wrote Bond. Uh, I don't think he sat down and went, right, I want to denigrate women. 
No, he just sat down and went, right, I want to write these great stories that are great ideas, blah, blah, blah. But his worldview, his attitudes came out in what he wrote, probably subconsciously. Taken was actually a deliberate choice. The people who wrote Taken actually wanted to create a role model who did what this character did. And you'll notice, if you go back and watch the Taken movies, there's not a single swear word in English. <laughs> not a single swear word in English. Right? The people who wrote the Taken films made a very conscious decision about the message that they wanted the film to carry. Within this pretty package, international espionage, spy moves, blah, blah, blah. Within that pretty package, there's a very deliberate message contained in the film. This is going on all the time. There is very little that you would have watched in your entire life that someone who was behind it didn't make a conscious choice about the message that that piece of entertainment would contain. All creative work contains the worldview of the people who made it. Let me just see where I'm up to. Alright, that's the letter. Now, again, I'm not here to tell you which worldview is better. I just want you to become aware of how much worldview is being fed to you through the, the, the media that you consume and the entertainment you consume. We have an arts industry in Australia that is completely dependent on the government. This is one of its biggest flaws and also one of the biggest opportunities because now I want to get to talking about what we can do about this and how we can change this. And I don't think it's as hard as most people believe it is. We have a situation at the moment where pretty much nothing in the arts gets made in Australia without the government first giving it its ticket approval in the form of some kind of a grant. Almost everything, and I have a lot of friends in the arts community, and the number of times they post on Facebook about how they're applying for some grant or other, the number of hours they spend learning how to apply for grants and scouring the various government websites about what grants are available, they are completely dependent on government funding. And what that means is that nothing in this country gets made without a bureaucrat looking at it and going, ooh, I like that. If you are wondering why the arts community in Australia is shit, it's largely because we're only making what, what bureaucrats like. Honestly, that is the brutal reality of the Australian arts industry. This is why we suck around the world, with some exceptions. But by and large, the Australian arts industry is kind of rubbish. And we shouldn't be. Let's think about some films that have been made in Australia that have been written, directed, and therefore not approved by Australians, that have been written, directed by people overseas, things like The Matrix. Internationally successful. Spawned a whole new genre of film. The Great Gatsby. Huge money spent, made in Australia. There have been a lot of films made in Australia that have been tremendously successful around the world. You know what differentiates them from the Australian failures? They didn't get approved by a bureaucrat. The Australian failures did. If you've ever wondered why Australian films always seem to have this kind of really negative overtone, this kind of this self-hatred thing going on, <coughs> it's because that's how bureaucrats see your country. You know, the people who are being paid by, by you to work for you, <laughs> that's what they like. That's how they see you. And they are so out of touch with Australian audiences that when they give their ticket of approval to a project, audiences universally don't. Yeah? They go, oh, I love this, this is a great idea, we've got to make this. And audiences go, oh, okay, what's on TV? I'm not going to pay the money to go to the cinema to watch that piece of rubbish. Now, this is what's wrong with the arts industry in Australia, but it's also the opportunity that we have. I want to show you some statistics here. In 2013, the number one highest grossing film in Australia was Iron Man 3. $36 million. Now, that's the box office gross, so that's the through the door, what people have paid over the counter. That's not what the film we've got back. We'll talk about that in a moment. But over the counter, people pay $36 million in Australia to see that film. That's less than 2 million tickets. What that means is that the number one film in 2013 had about 21 million people go, oh, okay, can't be bothered. And about 2 million people actually show up and watch it. And that's the most successful. Let's stop and start to think about the implications here. There are a huge number of people not bothering to go and consume media in this country. Not bothering to go and watch films. When you look at the statistics on people watching television, you know, networks get so excited about having a million eyeballs. It means they have about 22, 23 million people who couldn't be bothered. There is a huge percentage of Australia's population who are not currently consuming media. You know why? There's a lot of people out there like me, and I'm sure like a lot of you, who've looked at it over a long period of time and gone, you know what? No. I'm just not interested. I just, I don't want what you're making. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of you here, but are you sure that it doesn't have more to do with 
institutions people That is part of it, definitely. And I was tremendously amused by the whole the whole palaver that happened over the, the most recent episode of um, the Game of Thrones, where they were carrying on about oh, it's, you know, downloaded by this many people, how much money it's cost us and all this stuff. It's like well, your distribution box broken. <laughs> you know, when, when some guy who can't get laid sitting in a basement on the other side of the world can get a couple of million people to jump on his website and access his material, and you're spending millions of dollars and you can't you know, get people to actually pay you anything for it, well, you've got something wrong with the distribution problem. You know? uh, and yes, you're absolutely right. But what's interesting here is these are, these are, these, these are the biggest in the country. These are the most watched in the country. You want to find that so the other thing that goes this. Cinema is still the most watched medium in this country out of everything. You know, you, you'll find very few YouTube videos, even the ones that go huge, go viral, that'll attract anything like two million people in Australia alone. That's all in Australia alone. So this is still the most popular medium of, of entertainment in the country. And this is the best they can do. 2013, absolute best of us. My point here is to say that clearly something's wrong in the sense that some people are being serviced. Some people are never being given a reason to get off their asses and go to this. Now, some people never will. I grant you that. Let's say two thirds of the population will never do it. No matter how good a film is, no matter how interesting it is, they're going to download it, they're going to watch it later, or they're just not going to watch it at all. That still leaves you with 8 million people. 8 million people out of less than 2 million, you know, two million less than 2 million out of 8 million, you've still got a less than 25% hit rate of people who would actually show up. And these are the biggest and best films. There are people out there who would happily show up to a cinema who cannot be bothered. So that's point number one. Um, I just, sorry, I just yep. wanted to ask, um, one, of the, like, one of the things I've got looking at those rankings mm -hmm. is that um, some of the ones around the top do have quite a, a strong libertarian, or not quite libertarian, but like a strong message. Like Iron Man 3, you've mm -hmm. got a, a philanthropist millionaire. Um, Trying to privatise war. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you've got like Hunger Games, which is, you know, a bad, oppressive government and sort of fighting back from that. Uh, Black Pi, that's about sort of self, you know, reliance and subsistence. So, and Despicable Me too, which let's just be honest, is a really awesome movie. So, <laughs> sorry, continue. So, so they, I, I guess they have sort of those messages. None of them really strike me as super sort of lefty um, in their content and message. So does that sort of have any kind of reflection or indication or maybe that the times are changing? I, I don't know that I'd want to draw too much of a conclusion out of it at this point. As we go further down the list, you'll see that there is, there continues to be a very wide mix yeah. uh, as we go through. We're going to have a look at the top 100 at the moment. Um, so I, I, that would be interesting. And if someone wanted to do a study and actually have a look, is there any correlation between libertarian themes and box office success in Australia? Uh, I haven't done any research for that. Um, so I can't really answer that. Um, yeah? I'm, I'm working on a comic book. It's actually about this kid. He's a super quiet chicken. He cranked his like quiet chicken doll. <laughs> like, it's fun like, how this guy turned into like, a lovable guy who got a villain mm -hmm. throughout the whole country. But they're seeing it in a while about fascists. Um, my advice to you would be the same as my advice to that I made to a, a, an up and coming band that asked me some questions along the similar line. You know, how do we take a stand without offending people, without upsetting people? I take the Winston Churchill approach. Um, so you have enemies? Good. That means you stood for something. Um, I have a two-step plan for making enemies. If anyone in this room doesn't yet have any enemies and you really like them, you feel like you're missing out, uh, it's very, very easy to do. Step one, take a public stand on any issue. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what the issue is, and I don't care which side of it you pick, just take a public stand. Step two, wait. Your enemies will find you very soon. <laughs> um, so if you're worried about not making enemies, you're probably going to win the game. Um, well, the thing is, like, I just want to like, um, make a point that out there. The government's going to support some businesses, but that business is going to do whatever that they don't um, respond to. And that's what's wrong with the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think about um, black um, water, the first group, who actually put a lot of controversy like, across the Iraq? Mm -hmm. the, the US government tries to like, um, pose like a uh, prosecutor against the university, but no one got prosecuted yeah. because they're so powerful and they've got backing of the government or some 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, essentially what we've got here in Australia is, is a whole bunch of arts people pandering to the government and there's really the protection of the government. Yeah. As we know, whenever the government subsidises something, it crowds out by the funding. So what we have now is a protected industry where people who have learned how to play the system, people who have learned how to write their government arts grants are protected and competition is kept out from people like myself who find it very difficult to find low level arts funding uh, because the government has crowded out all the poor people funds. So we, we definitely have that problem. I'm just going to continue on. Um, as soon as I get my notes back. So, what I want to have a look at now though, which I find very interesting, is the bottom half of the top 100 from 2013. And I want you to have a look at the far right hand column of how much a film grossed. And notice that all the way down to number 96, films were grossing in the Australian box office over $2 million. Now I picked that number deliberately. Around about 10% of the box office gross goes back to the people who made the film in the first place. So if a box office gross is $2 million, the producers of the film get about $200,000 out of it. The rest of it goes to the marketing, goes to the actual system themselves, <coughs> distributors, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole lot of other people who take their slice before it ever actually gets back to the people who made the film in the process. And I think $200,000 is very deliberate because that's about the point where you can start to make a decent feature film if you're smart in this country. You can't do that in America, too unionised and too, too many rules, etc. Over here, they're trying to do the same thing. They haven't succeeded yet. There's still room for very low budget films to fly under the radar here. If you can be the 96th most successful film in this country alone on box office revenues alone, that's ignoring DVD sales, Blu-ray sales, it's ignoring online, it's ignoring TV rights re uh, revenues, it's ignoring going overseas and selling it elsewhere as well. You can pull back a respectable budget for a low budget film. When I say low budget, there are a lot of films that you would never realise were low budget that were made on a relatively small amount of money. This is where I think, this I think is our next step in terms of fighting this cultural war. Television, unfortunately, it's going to cost you $200,000 an episode. You have to keep it off week after week after week. I think films are where it's at as an interim step. If we're going to get into this cultural war, we need to be on this list. This is where we need to get. Yeah, why does it cost $200,000 an episode? South Park can make their shows in 90 minutes. Sorry? South Park make their shows in 90 minutes. Yeah, uh, if you have that level of genius, I suggest you get started. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I get what you mean. Um, South Park, they're an animated film, they're like an animated cartoon. Okay, so that's one, that's one genre that can be made a little bit less expensively. Uh, they've made a number of conscious decisions that help them to say, well, I mean, firstly, the animation is deliberately crap. Right? They, they're not spending money. This is not, this is not an avatar level of special effects that we're talking about here. They've made conscious decisions that work for their style now. It's been tremendously successful, lots of people all over around the world. We can't make all of that like that. So for example, I'm in the, I've just done a pilot for a debate TV show that's going to cost between 35 and 50 grand an episode. So I say 200 grand, 200 grand an episode will pay for an episode of drama. So for a low budget version of the United States of Tara that we were looking at before, you can make that for the video and that's what the grand is. Uh, or you can make a feature film for the same thing. And that's just kind of the reality of, of, of the way the industry works. This is where we need to be. We're going to get to the point that, think about it, when someone mentions a capitalist and you ask your average person on the street and then you say, okay, um, think of a capitalist. They're either going to think of someone they read about in the news or they think of someone they saw in a movie. If they think of someone they saw in a movie, it's going to be someone like Gordon Gekko from Wall Street giving his greedy's good speech. It's going to be the guy from um, The Wolf of Wall Street. It's going to be these kinds of people who have very negative connotations attached to it when you say, oh, what's a capitalist? We need to change that. We need to tell stories that have capitalists that are actually portrayed in the good way. We need to tell stories that have libertarians that are actually portrayed in a good light, rather than that episode of the United States of Time. Now, we cannot stop the left from using the media. They're going to keep on doing it. But what we can do is we can increase the number of voices that are being heard inside popular culture and popular media. And what that does is it broadens the range of choices that people are being given from which they will probably choose what they believe. We can't override it. We can't take it over. But we can increase the range of voices that are actually heard. In my opinion, this is absolutely essential to the long-term success of the libertarian movement. We can win all the political debates we want, all the economic debates we want, we can have the best academic support in the world. And we need it, and we need the people who are doing it to keep on doing it. But if we lose the culture war badly enough, in the end, 
it will not be politically possible for our elected representatives to do anything other than chase the culture wherever that culture goes. That's the challenge that we face today. So that's it from me. Uh, but I'd like to open the floor to more questions. I've you know, had some already very good questions. Uh, if anyone has any, yeah. Uh, this is a question on the how blatant um, the, the sort of political leanings are. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there a risk? And you said it's gotten worse. More, um, it's more blatant recently. Do you think there's an extent to which the left have sort of pushed it too far, where it's so obvious that that people know? I'm thinking of um, what's his name, the born identity guy. Um, uh, Matt Damon, who yeah. um, in that uh, film where he plays the genius, uh, there's a scene in there in which um, it's, it's almost irrelevant to the plot of the, the film, but he points out how it's in the people's history of the United States. Um, and it's just a little, little advertising thing in the middle of the film. Yeah. And apparently he himself insisted that that, that was inserted into that, that film. And I, I just saw that straight away. Yeah. What happens, there's a real symbiotic relationship that happens here. The, the film industry, the entertainment industry, they are accustomed to the old way of doing things where there are gatekeepers who can decide who gets to be successful and who doesn't. So you can those who are the production houses themselves, your MGMs, your Lions Game, your, all these sort of big publishing houses, um, or production companies. They decide what's successful, they decide what script gets made, they decide the actors that go in it, they decide who directs it, they make and break people's careers, and they of course have been making decisions about who they will pick based on politics. So what happens is they have a particular political leaning, typically of the left, typically anti-liberty. They therefore choose scripts that have that leaning. They choose actors to play in those scripts that have that leaning and they make superstars out of these people. And then because of the superstar status that these people have, they get to go out in the world and if the world asks them their opinion on all sorts of things that of course they know nothing about because they're freaking actors, not geniuses. Uh, and that's a situation there where, yeah, they got it, I think, a bit too clever for their own good. Uh, and made it very, very obvious what was going on. Uh, and that's, there's plenty of other examples where, where the directors really, or you know, writers, directors, production houses have really just overplayed their hand. The problem is that most people just sit and blindly absorb this stuff. When I went back to class after watching that episode of the United States of Tara, we had to, as a class, we had to talk about it, what we liked and what we didn't. They talked all about how amazing the lead actresses, Tony Collette's acting was, which was brilliant. I'm good at that. Um, and then they talked about how horrible that guy was. Now the two things that people talked about out of that episode, half an hour of entertainment. The main two takeaways, Tony Collette was really good, and he was really shit. You know, and that's, it's that obvious. And they're actors. They should know, like they're studying the game. They know how the game works. Mr. Totally Mr. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, I'll get to you in a second, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, no, no, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so I was just going to say, um, with the whole blatant sort of stuff, I really can't see how with environmental things you can really get much more blatant in capital climate with like <laughs> the, the like the Saudis factories that just put smoke into the air yep. and yep. destroy the ozone layer yep. because they think it's fun. Yep. <laughs> means, like, there's no one actually like this. Yep. And then people they like, created caricatures. Now that works in cartoons, it works in kids entertainment, but as, as minds grow, they become a bit more sophisticated, they become a bit more clever, uh, and that's where you end up with things like Avatar and these sorts of things where very, very slick, very high production values, a lot of money is being spent, but at the end of the day, it's exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, uh, do you think the economy is average, perhaps just conditioning people to react to the No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think what, what this is doing is it's getting people where they actually make the decisions, and that's at an emotional level. Um, the vast majority of people, like I said earlier, they, they're not making the decisions from here, they're making it from here. So let me just throw away out just an example of what I think might be a great feature film to reverse some of these things with environmentalism and the UN and that sort of stuff. So uh, we take a really pretty uh, lead female actress, someone named someone who's really hot right now. Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. Okay, so we're going to have Jennifer Lawrence as an international aid worker who is working in a hospital in the deepest, darkest Africa where they're currently dealing with an outbreak of Ebola. Alright? Problem is she's so far off the grid that she needs power for the hospital because she doesn't have enough power in that hospital to keep the vaccines and, and medicines cold to run a, a life support machine at the same time. How does she right? get on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first world problems. <laughs> um, 
So now we introduce a, so she then cries out to the aid agency that she works for and says, I need, I need power, I need to be able to run a generator. Well, unfortunately, there's UN rules that say that in order for the country that she's working to get the UN aid development money, they have to comply with certain emissions protocols and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not making this up, this is actually true. So then she can't have a generator because she's not allowed to, she's not allowed to emit CO2 because it won't work from the government's point of view. So she then goes on a personal mission, gets the attention of someone within the UN, and that person comes out and visits her, this high-powered guy who's moved up a long way in the UN, he's going to save the day. And so he comes in and we discover at some point in time that actually he's there for a completely personal agenda. He thought she was cute, wants to rape her, whatever it might be. All right? We turn him into a bad guy. Yeah? So now we've completely trashed the UN. We've already identified that there are some serious negative consequences to emissions reduction schemes and these sorts of things. So now let's bring in an emotional element. Let's say that there's a, a native of the local area that is helping her as she runs the hospital. He's a really lovely guy, really gentle, slightly older male. Right? He's completely aware of all the problems and he just pours his heart out every single day trying to keep this hospital running. But he's well aware of the, the, what they're facing in terms of the challenges. They don't have power to actually keep people alive. And then one day, he falls sick. He's on life support because of him they've had to turn off the fridges. So he makes a decision that while she's out of the room, he unplugs himself. He dies right there in that room so that she can turn the fridges back on after he's dead. Now you cast the right people in that film, and that's, I mean, I'm not spouting, I'm spouting rubbish all the time in my head here. That's not a well-resolved script, all right? But you understand it's the emotional pull. It's watching that guy die in that bed. It's watching her have that argument with that asshole human guy who just wanted a bit of ass. It's these are the things that are going to leave their mark. And then, the next time someone gets into an argument about human aid programs, the next time someone gets into an argument about regulated carbon emissions and the fact that we need to move to a low-energy future, these are the things that start to go, oh, but yeah, but I saw Jennifer Lawrence and she had this. And that's what's happening right now with the United States of Tariffs, what's happening right now with Captain Planet. This is highly manipulative stuff, but this is what's already been done. And these, these are the kind of games that we need to get into play. Yep. Um, there's some uh, well, consumer areas out there. Who's are they being willing to like, bankroll this kind of? I'd love to meet them if they're right. Um, you know, I'm in dialogue. With, I'm, I'm in dialogue with a few people who's, who I, I might mention, but at the end of the day, um, you know, this isn't about me. This is about anyone who's got a good idea, or anyone who knows anyone who's got a good idea. Get out there, write the script, pitch it to the right people, get it made, get it out there, make some money out of it, and go and make it all. Uh, sorry, you, you had your hand up, Lee. Second ago. Uh, yeah, my point was that humans presuming that are Yeah, but what we're doing is we're expanding the range of options that we're seeing. Right. At the moment, we're only seeing one set of options, really. I mean, with some exceptions, as, as someone pointed out, there are some exceptions. But by and large, there's a real bias. We need to try and address that. Yeah. Um, there's a sort of program that does these sort of things in America called Declaration Entertainment. They're, okay. uh, uh, they're funded, sort of crowdfunding sort of thing. They produce a few low budget. Can you throw some names at me? What is that? Uh, um, uh, it's run by Bill Will. Okay. Is this uh, like Fireproof and, um, yeah, uh, yeah uh, was it Fireproof, um, they made a couple of others. Uh, they've unfortunately cornered themselves into the conservative Christian market, yeah. uh, which is great, that might be great. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, the rich is converted at the moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there was a hand up way back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your opinion about Dallas, uh, Dallas Fires? Well, I mean, it's very late. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, you, a lot of times if you ask me what I think of the movie, yeah. my answer is going to be haven't seen it. Um, I've stayed away from a lot of popular, popular culture for the last decade now. For, for no, it just talks about bringing in gov uh, drugs against FDA rules. People get the drugs, start, they get thrown in jail, the drugs yeah. get thrown out. And yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. It's criminal. Yeah, I, I, might, I might need to check it out. Um, did you have your hand up a second ago? So, yes, you can. Um, I was wondering what the, the possibility of having somebody is more controversial and Either TV shows or movies, yep. and not kind of delivering them in a movie theater or television mm -hmm. online. Yes, yes. Um, the online distribution model is gathering momentum really quickly. Uh, I don't believe it's yet mature enough to really be able to reliably fund the film out of it in the same way you, you can potentially fund the film through the box office. Um, but it's gathering momentum. Um, I I think there is room at the moment for a combination of crowdfunding film and delivery online. So you, for example, crowdfund every frame is worth a dollar. So you go, okay, there's 160,000 frames in this film, and we're going to crowdfund it, we're going to ask people to buy a frame for a dollar each. You 
you get 160 grand to make the film and then you give it to those people who support it. They bought it for a dollar essentially, they get access to it and then you sell it online. So I don't think online distribution is yet mature enough to fund a film in its entirety. I think it's a legitimate part of the strategy. Can I just say, I saw um, this very controversial documentary, it was about I think 30 episodes of 30 minutes each one, and it was really well done and fully online, no um, physical distribution. Yeah, okay. And people were paying for it online? It was, no, it was offered um, free, but well, I'm sure it was very So that's been funded online. by some sort of organisation. Yeah, that is happening, that's, that's good. Um, are you worried about losing the high moral grants? So I was looking at the arguments that the West accept. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm worried about losing my freedom. Uh, that's mostly what I'm worried about. Uh, and at the moment, I'm losing my freedom because stupid people are making bad arguments to be the stupid people. Uh, anyway. So, to me, I think we're getting the game. I don't think we should be dishonest, but we need to recognise that there is there is a lot of scope to take an argument and make it emotional without being dishonest about it. We're showing the consequences of decisions. Essentially, that's when you watch a film, what you watch is I watch people making decisions. That's what you're watching. So let's watch some people make some decisions that are fashionable and cool and that the left would tell you the right decisions to make, and then let's watch their lives fall apart. And then of course we bring it to a happy ending because we have to. Uh, but let's actually watch that happen and, and see how that affects people emotionally. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I was just thinking, it seems to me there's a comedic deficit with libertarian, like you can't look at the programs such as the Daily Show, the Sarah Paul. They're, they're fantastic and equals everyone, but it just seems like if you see Grove and Norquist doing stand up, it's just yep. the worst thing you've ever seen. Yeah, uh, there's actually a lot of really good libertarian stand up comedians who aren't on television, uh, and you'll find them on YouTube and various places like that. But uh, this is again where the gatekeepers are, are kind of hurting the libertarian movement. There, the, the people in the networks are saying, Yes, we'll get you to host our show, and we're going to completely ignore you over there because we don't like your politics. That's changing. The gatekeepers are losing power and they hate it, and it's hilarious. Um, because things like online distribution is becoming a new thing, uh, because people like me are able to actually get things made, the digital revolution has made equipment so much cheaper, uh, thanks to the population <coughs> and media studies and these sorts of things, uh, that there are so many people out there now doing things on a budget and finding ways to make it work, uh, that gradually the gatekeepers are losing power. But at the moment, in terms of what's broadcast on television, you've still got to get through a gatekeeper, and they're the ones making those decisions. Yep. Uh, what do you think of the Ayn Rand films? And do you, would you agree that libertarians might have an easier go than, say, social conservatives. Um, I can think of, say, Drew, yes. Drew Care. I, mean, I can't imagine a, a very conservative evangelical Christian with, like, a mainstream film about family values and yeah. not having sex before marriage sort of thing. That, that will get watched by people in the south of the United States. Yeah. yeah. And that is being done. There are plenty of those sorts of films around. Uh, and they can be profitable. Uh, and some of them aren't completely rubbish. Uh, most of them are. Um, the, the problem with the Ayn Rand films is it's a classic case of preaching the converted. Who besides an, a, a libertarian is going to watch an Ayn Rand film? No one else knows who she is. No one else cares who she is. They want to come home, you know, listen to their favourite radio station on the way home, turn on their favourite TV show, uh, look forward to the breakfast radio on their way to work tomorrow morning, and then hopefully go and watch a movie on the weekend. When they pick their movie, they're not going to go, oh, Ayn Rand, cool. <laughs> This is not our target market. These aren't the people we're trying to reach. I value those films. I think it's a really, really good thing to do. There is a lot of scope for preaching the converted. There is a lot of there's a lot of value to be found in, in inspiring and raising up people who will already agree with you. But if we're actually going to win the culture war, we've got to reach out and get people who disagree with us. Yeah? I think it's also like a lot of theory to push into three or films. Yeah. Really. So maybe going with like a like one let me tell you a, a quick anecdote just to illustrate what I mean. Um, my cousin, who is now a Baptist pastor, um, and at the time was, was you know, very active in church and so forth, and yeah, very conservative Christian fashion. Um, myself and one of his mates were going to go and watch a movie. I can't remember what the movie was. We, we got there and they changed their mind. They didn't want to watch that movie. Now they wanted to watch uh, V for Vendetta. Right? I was like, I didn't even know what it was. Let's go and watch it. Fine. Let's go and have a look. Sat in the film, watched it, watched it all the way through, got out the other side. We're walking down the street and they were gushing. Oh, we're 
great movie? Did you see the special effects? Did you see this? Did you see that? It was all about either the plot and the plot twists or the special effects. The actual story, the actual underlying meaning of it, completely missed it. But what was interesting was this very conservative Christian um, cousin of mine completely missed the hatchet job that they did on organised religion and completely missed, and this is something that I think a lot of people have missed, and again, I'm not taking a position here, I'm just illustrating, I know what his position is, and I find it interesting that he missed this. Every single relationship, love relationship, that was portrayed positively in that film was homosexual. Every single heterosexual relationship, with the exception of the sexual tension between the two lead characters, was negative in the form of rape, in the form of incest, in the form of all kinds of negative stuff. There was a very clear, the Wachowski brother, or Wachowski siblings are notorious for this. They will build into their films all kinds of social messages. Right? This, is, this is what they do. And here this conservative Christian, now Baptist pastor, had completely missed the underlying message of the film. Now again, I don't say that to take a side, I say that to make a point here. He was oblivious to the fact that he just watched a one and a half hour long sermon that completely contradicted his own moral stance and his, his opinion on those issues. Missed it. Totally. But he can't change the fact that it would have influenced him, and he now feels for characters and so forth. So this is this is what I'm saying. We, we get in there, we give these messages, we package them nicely. Most people aren't going to consciously realise what the message is, but it will hit them, it will influence them. Then, Sorry. And you're suggesting from a subconscious level that people who watch that, even though they're not think they're not studying gender politics or anything like this, they, they'll it, see the nice gay couple and they'll have more positive things. Exactly. So uh, there are a huge number of people who have now attended a gay wedding thanks to Modern Family. Yeah, here's these characters that they love, that they, that, you know, they've laughed, they've cried for these guys, they've, they've watched these guys go through their ups and downs, and now they've attended their wedding. Well, you know, gay marriage isn't even legal in Australia yet, but they've attended, they've been to a wedding. This is the power of, of, of this kind of meeting. Yeah. Um, I'm sure most people are aware that there's a big trend, especially in the left, uh, of urging for better representation for like, the disabled groups right. and they have uh, minority groups in general. Do you think that the trend should be trying to double up the job on training? I reject the idea of quotas just on principle. Um, so let me just put that out there because yeah. there are people in the industry who call yeah, for that kind of thing. Um, if you, as a producer, as a writer, as a director, as a creative, think that that is to your advantage or that that's something you're passionate about and you want to tell, absolutely, go for it. Um, could that work to your advantage? Absolutely. I'm writing a feature film at the moment that the whole thing takes place inside the cockpit of an aircraft. I made the tactical decision to make the pilot a female because that would get me written about in the age. Okay, the lead character who's the pilot of the, of the, of the plane and the lead character of the film is a female low layer. I didn't need it to be that way around. I did it because it would get the attention of certain people who I need for policy. Simple as that. So, rational decisions, yes, absolutely. Yeah, some of them, yeah. Isn't it meant that it's not as good as copy of it? Um, of course, it's not, it's not ever going to be a. Yeah, I guess in the same way that Avatar is kind of prompted, yeah. It's never going to be a mouthpiece for it's, it's a left anarchist. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a left anarchist. Sorry. Alan Moore is a left anarchist, but yeah. the movie was portrayed far more um, neutral towards the anarchy. The, the anarchist themes are totally subdued. Have you seen the film? Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's not based on. It's also a feature film, they don't make money. Yeah. But the, the original author's intent doesn't actually matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at what happened with uh, the, the recent rendition of Noah. You know, the original author's intent. <laughs> <laughs> God or Moses or whoever it was that wrote it down was completely ignored uh, in the most recent rendition. So yeah, you're right. It's the original author's intent doesn't matter. It's 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 the decisions of the producer, the director, and the actors make all. But if they've chosen a certain author with a certain thing is against the agreement of certain. Things. Yeah, and I would I would say it's, it is a lefty anarchist um, worldview that's espoused in there. Uh, there are elements of it that I agree with. There are massive elements of it that I don't. Um, you know. But at the end of the day, they, they got paid to preach that sermon. They got to stand up in cinemas all over the world and preach that sermon, and they got paid to do it. We've got time for a few more questions, but I want to take some presidential privilege to interject again that um, actually taking a, a, a source that is hostile to your ideology and then producing it in such a way that makes it friendly to your ideology is incredibly powerful. Because now when people think people are they don't think that they are They think, oh, like, authoritarianism is bad. So it's a powerful reverse. Who would 
long did you live? Uh, that's, that's a discussion for another time. You had a question? Yes, I have a question. What's a good way that uh, we can imagine to promote a more libertarian artists or perhaps have the artists come out as libertarians? We all well, that's happening more and more. That's yeah. happening more and more. It's, it's becoming cool in yeah. real. Yeah, it's becoming cool in Hollywood to start to actually say, hey, actually, I'm a libertarian. And whoever it was that said libertarian is easier than, than, conservative, than, than conservatism, absolutely. Um, you can be cool and be a libertarian, you can't be cool and be a conservative. So that is already happening. The number one thing, and, and I don't say this from a mercenary support me point of view, find artists whose worldview you agree with and support them. Bands, painters, poets, comedians, whatever that is, find them, support them. Um, I would not, I, I've been in this game now for over five years, but I haven't been prolific, I haven't done a huge amount of work, but I've been paid bills and so forth over that same period of time. I would not be able to still be going if it weren't for a handful of people who have gotten behind every single thing I've done, not just financially, but also just promoting it, telling people about it, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's that core group of people that become your, your go-to people that make it possible for most artists to continue. And that's true on all sides of politics. So if you can become one of those people for artists that you support, then that's a very, very powerful thing. Um, sorry, there was someone further back who hadn't asked anything yet. Was it uh, else? Oh, okay. Um, yep, all right. I know movies, like movies on my spot, right. comic book is. Yep. If we could possibly do the comic book industry, we could make our comics and for music as in last year's show. I don't follow. Uh, well, let's, let's say you can make a comic book, the five year comic book, as the next, um, probably as a new year. Yeah, the, it's the market, that just, the market decided that, that oh. Shakespeare was Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare didn't decide that Shakespeare was Shakespeare. He just wrote stuff and put it out there. The market then said, this is awesome. Let's, you know, and hundreds of years later, we're still doing stuff. If it was really hit, there's a whole controversy. Um, I think we just need to be prolific. The world cannot be influenced by the, the ideas inside your head. They can only be influenced by the things that you've finished okay. and the things that you've actually published. So it's about actually, if you if you rate yourself as an artist in any way, shape, or form, just get stuff out there. The first thing you make is going to be rubbish. The first time I entered Tropfest, it was terrible. No one has ever seen that film aside from Tropfest judges. It will probably never be seen again. We're going to make that by. Second time I entered Tropfest, it was still pretty awful. Third time I entered Tropfest, I made the finals. But if I hadn't entered those first two times where I was rubbish, I would never have gotten good enough to make the finals uh, in January last year. So it's about getting stuff out there and learning the lessons. Yes. Uh, that, that, sorry, we haven't got time for another question, but thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.